Okay guys, in this video we are going to talk about um, the solution, uh, the properties of solutions. Uh, and the first, uh, the first properties we're going to talk about are the uh, thermodynamic properties. And we're going to focus on, on just ideal solutions here. Uh, you, what you're going to find is that the, the equations that we have here on this slide for the uh, thermodynamics of ideal solutions are very similar to the equations that we had for the mixing of ideal gases. Uh, and so the equations look the same, but they're not the same, they're not, it's not for the same reason, as I'll try to explain. So here we have, um, this is an equation that we've looked at before. Uh, I just wanted to go through it, read it from left to right, and explain what the terms mean again. So here we're talking about uh, this mu j. So this is the chemical potential of component j in solution, so in an ideal solution. That is referenced against the chemical potential of pure component j, and that's what the star denotes. So this is the chemical potential for pure component j. And then here we have a correction factor involving um, the natural log of the mole fraction of component J in solution. Okay, so this is our uh, our approach for calculating the chemical potential of a component J in an ideal solution. Uh, when you go to look at the mixing of an ideal solution, if you go back to um, how we defined an ideal solution, uh, we talked about how in an ideal solution, the interactions between the solute and solvent are the same as they are in the pure solute and in the pure solvent. So it's as if that the solute and sol solvent molecules, they don't know the difference between each other. And therefore, all the inter intermolecular interactions are the same. This is true when the solute and solvent have the same shape, the same size, um, same chemical properties. And so in that case, the change in energy when you mix and the change in enthalpy when you mix would both be zero. Okay? And it's not because the solute and solvent are not interacting with one another. It's because the interactions between the solute and solvent are the same as those in the pure components. For the same reason, uh, the change in volume when you mix two, com two components of an ideal solution. There's no, there's no difference in volume. That is, the volumes are additive. And again, it's, it's because the interactions between the solute and solvent are the same. The entropy, however, uh, does change. And so when you, when you randomly mix things together, this is the equation that you get for uh, the mixing of an ideal solution, you'll notice that it's identical in form to the um, mixing equation for ideal gases. And the same thing's true for the delta G. So when you, uh, when you mix, mix up an ideal solution, because the, because the mole fraction of, of all of the components will be less than one, this sum will be negative. The negative times the negative of the sum is going to give you a positive delta S of mixing. Uh, and consequently, the delta G is going to be negative. And so ideal solutions always form spontaneously. Uh, here's a plot of delta G of mixing for an ideal solution. You see that it bottoms out for the 50-50 um, uh, percent, mole percent um, for the entropy, it's the opposite, it peaks at a mole fraction of 0.5. Uh, these two plots are, are identical for ideal gas mixing uh, that we've looked at previously. Uh, so here we're being asked to, to calculate the Gibbs energy uh, and the entropy change for mixing an ideal solution of, of benzene and, and, and toluene. Uh, it looks like I've probably forgotten to, to put the concentration on there. So you might just assume a 0.5 
mole fraction mixture. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip the details of the calculation, but what you need to do is to execute these two formulas. So there'll be a term for benzene and there'll be a term for toluene. Um, if, you know, if you know the mole fraction of benzene, then you can calculate the mole fraction of toluene. Let's suppose that the mole fraction of, of, of benzene in this problem was 0.25. So if you're given that XB equals 0 0.25, then because the mole fractions of a binary mixture always add up to one, you then know the mole fraction of the toluene. And so then you would take these two mole fractions and then you would substitute this, them into this equation along with the temperature to calculate the, the delta G and the delta S of mixing. You're going to find that the delta G of mixing is less than zero and the delta S of mixing is going to be greater than zero, which is always true for an ideal solution. Now let's talk a little bit about real solutions. So as the name implies, real solutions exhibit deviations from ideal behavior. And the main reason for this is that the solute and solvent interactions are not, are not the same as they are for the pure components. And, and that is going to be true for most solutions. Most solutions are not ideal, which is very different from gases. Most gases, under ordinary conditions, behave ideally. It's not true for solutions because this requirement that the solute and solvent interactions be the same is, is, not, is not generally satisfied for most solutions. And so in that case, the enthalpy of mixing and the energy of mixing can be either positive or negative, and it's, it's not that easy to predict uh, what that is going to be. So we'll just take that to be an unknown. Usually it's not very large, and the reason I say that delta H of mixing is not very large for, for many solutions is that in order to form the solution, you have to break intermolecular bonds in both the solute and the solvent. Okay, so that costs energy. That tends to make the process endothermic. But then you form new bonds between the solute and solvent when you mix them together. And so that's going to give you an exothermic component. What I'm talking about are intermolecular bonds. So it, you, you both break bonds and you form bonds when you make a real solution. And it just depends upon which bonds are stronger, uh, you know, more attractive. That determines whether or not the enthalpy of mixing is going to be positive or negative. But it can be both. It's usually small. Delta S of mixing, we normally think of it as being a positive quantity. Right, because when you make us, um, when uh, I thought I had a picture nearby, but um, when you when you mix two components together, uh, this this typically, if you mix them randomly together, it will increase the number of microstates available to the system, and so that tends to make the entropy uh, change positive. However, that's it's not always the case that you get random mixing. Uh, the interactions between the solute and the solvent, the energy interactions, can affect um, how the inter how the uh, how the two substances mix together. Uh, so it's possible that uh, the change in the entropy can actually be negative due to non-random mixing effects. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, consider a, a nonpolar molecule like like methane, CH4. Now it can be dissolved in, in water. And in order for the, uh, the methane to be dissolved in water, you have to break some hydrogen bonding in the solvent to make some energy for, or to make some room for, for the solute molecule to be accepted, to be solvated. And then in order for um, the, the methane molecules to stay in solution, the water molecules, they have to surround uh, the, uh, the methane molecule. And the way they do that is they form a, a rather tight network of hydrogen bonds, which are unlike what you would have in pure water, uh, to secure or cage 
the, uh, the methane molecule. And it turns out that that's a fairly ordered structure. That it's called a clathrate structure. Uh, and and it's, it's fairly rigid and inflexible. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it's not totally caged in the sense that the water molecules can't move in, in and out, but it's there are, there are, it turns out that there's fewer microstates available to the system when you have this non-random mixing, which means that the delta S will be negative in that case. Okay, and that leads to, uh, if you take both effects, both the energy effect and the enthalpy effect, your delta G of mixing for a real solution can either be negative or positive. And when it's negative, the solution spontaneously forms uh, if you're in a set of conditions where delta G of mixing turns out to be positive, then the solution won't form spontaneously. What you're going to wind up is with uh, immiscible liquids. Uh, the term partially immiscible liquids means that the two substances will mix together under certain, um, certain concentrations. Okay, so over a particular range of compositions, you can find that the solution will form spontaneously. Uh, but under other uh, concentration ranges, they don't form spontaneously. And this tells you that the concentration, of, concentration contribution to the Gibbs energy, which would involve the uh, chemical potentials of the different components, that also plays a role in the Gibbs energy of mixing. And it can get quite complicated, uh, especially for partially miscible liquids, because you've got, you know, energy effects to consider, entropy effects to consider, and then there's also uh, effects of the composition and chemical potential that you would um, uh, include in that. So, so, so that I just wanted to say, have a few remarks about um, real solutions compared to ideal solutions. For the, for the rest of this talk, we're going to go back to the ideal solution picture. We don't really need to adopt the, um, the uh, real solutions, the, the complications of the real solution to, con to continue. Uh, and what we're going to talk about next is a set of solution properties that are called colligative properties. And so colligative properties are, are properties of a solution that depend upon the number of solute particles that are dissolved in the solution, but they don't depend upon the identity of the solute. So uh, these colligative properties, you can think of them as just being kind of true in general for all solutions. Uh, and there's four that we like to focus on. One is called the vapor pressure lowering, which means that the vapor pressure of the solvent when it's in solution is lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Related to this, the boiling point of the solvent in solution is larger, it's elevated, compared to the boiling point of pure solvent. Conversely, the freezing point of a solvent is lower, it's depressed relative, the freezing point of a solvent in solution is depressed relative to the freezing point of the pure solvent. And then we'll talk about the osmotic pressure effect as well. So, uh, like I said, we're going to be going back to, to just simply thinking about ideal solutions. And so here, what we'll find is that the colligative properties that we're talking about, they essentially all emerge from this entropy of mixing, this random entropy, the increase in entropy due to random mixing. Okay. This turns out to um, lower the chemical potential of the solvent. Uh, let's see. I'll go ahead and wait on the figure. So in, in, this, in, in these uh, remaining slides, we're going to talk about a, a binary solution where you've got a, a volatile solvent. Okay, so, so the solvent has a reasonably high vapor pressure. But then the solute, um, which will denote B, is a non-volatile solute. Uh, it doesn't significantly contribute to the vapor pressure of the solution. Um, and so you don't really have to, to think much about its contribution to the vapor phase above the solution. And then it also, when the solvent, when the solution freezes, the solute is not frozen in the solution. It's basically kicked out of the, of, of the solid. Okay, so, 
So, so that's what we're referring to here when we're talking about the, the non-volatile solute. It doesn't contribute to the vapor pressure of the solution, and uh, when the solvent, when the solution freezes, it's the, the solute isn't relevant to the to the solid that forms. So, um, according to our, our definition here that we've been looking at for an ideal solution, the chemical potential of the solvent is referenced against the chemical potential of the pure solvent, that's what the star means, and then the correction factor in this case for an ideal solution is always going to be negative, right? The mole fraction uh, by definition of the solvent will be less than one, so the natural log of a number less than one is negative. That means that the chemical potential of the solvent in solution is always lower than that of the pure solvent. So we have a lowering of the chemical potential of the solvent. Like I said, so here we're going to plot the, the chemical potential versus temperature for our solution. As I said before, the solute does not participate in the formation of the solid solvent. So the chemical potential of the solid is unchanged when you make a solution. Likewise, the chemical potential of the gas, the solvent vapor, is unaffected by this non-volatile solute. Even if the solute was volatile, because we could treat them both as ideal gases that don't interact, the chemical potential of the solvent would be unaffected by the presence of the solute. However, for the liquid phase, let this blue line represent the liquid, the, the chemical potential of the pure solvent, its chemical potential will be affected by the presence of the solute, and as we've seen in the previous formula, it will be lowered. Okay, so when you make a solution, the solvent's chemical potential will drop down to what this red line is. Now, we've talked about these types of diagrams before, <clears throat> and we know that the intersection of the liquid and vapor chemical potentials defines the boiling point. Well, what happens when you make a solution? You lower that chemical potential of the liquid but leave the vapor unchanged. That causes the boiling point temperature to become larger. So we have boiling point elevation. Likewise, but, but, but conversely, the intersection of the solid and the pure liquid's chemical potential defines the freezing point of the pure liquid. But when you form a solution that lowers the chemical potential curve of the liquid, and we see that that depresses the freezing point of the, uh, of the solvent in the solution. Okay, so, so this is why we get boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. You'll notice that the magnitude of the freezing point depression is very much larger than the magnitude of the boiling point elevation, and that has to do with the slopes of these different curves. And we may recall that the slope of these curves is related to minus the molar entropy. Okay, and so because the, there's not a, that large of a difference between the molar entropy of a liquid and a solid, they are different, but the difference is not as great between the liquid and the vapor. That's what gives rise to the smaller boiling point elevation compared to the freezing point depression. So let's talk a little bit more about the vapor pressure lowering. Um, essentially the solution has a higher entropy. Uh, the liquid solution is going to have a, um, or yeah, the, the solution has a higher entropy than the pure liquids. Okay? And, and ultimately what this results in is a um, it results in a, a, a lower tendency for the solvent to vaporize. So here's, here's a couple of cartoons. So this represents the pure liquid, the pure solvent, and its vapor phase. And, you know, there's just a certain tendency for the liquid to vaporize. So when the, the vapor and the liquid are in equilibrium, you wind up with this vapor pressure at a given temperature. When you make the solution, that is when you add some solute particles in here, this increases the number of microstates relative to the pure liquid. That means that, these, that the solution here has a higher entropy than the pure liquid. 
And what that ends up doing is it, it ends up decreasing the tendency for that liquid to vaporize relative to the pure liquid. Okay, so we wind up with a lower vapor pressure in the solution. Let's see, I'm going too far here. Okay, and so uh, what we've learned previously, we've previously learned about Raoult's law for ideal solutions, which tells us, and, and we can see the vapor pressure lowering effect right here. So this represents the vapor pressure of component A in the solution. This is the pure, pure component A's vapor pressure multiplied by the mole fraction of component A. This number is always less than 1, therefore PA is always less than PA star, hence vapor pressure lowering. Um, if we want to calculate the difference in vapor pressures, we'll take PA minus PA star, substituting in Raoult's law. We get this expression here. And we can rewrite this factor as minus the mole fraction of component B. The magnitude of the vapor pressure lowering, that is the size of delta P, is determined by the concentration of the solute, the mole fraction of component B. Notice that it doesn't depend upon the identity of component B. That's what makes this a colligative property. It depends upon the amount of solute, not upon the identity of the solute. And for the vapor pressure lowering, this term, because these two numbers are always positive, the delta P is always less than zero for the ideal solution. Uh, let's look next at vapor, uh, the boiling point elevation. Uh, as we've learned, there's an inverse relationship between vapor pressures and boiling points. So if you lower the vapor pressure of the solvent, that's going to have the effect of increasing the boiling point of the, of the solvent in solution. Here in this formula, uh, let's go ahead and just read it from left to right and just explain the terms. So here, what we're talking about, this is the chemical potential of component A in the vapor phase for the solution. As we've learned, the, the main rule of phase equilibrium is that the chemical potential of the component in all of the different phases are, are equal to one another when the system is at equilibrium. So the chemical potential of component A in the gas phase of the solution is equal to the chemical potential of component A in the liquid phase. And we have previously learned how to express this as the chemical potential of component A when it's pure in the liquid phase. And then this is the correction factor that we've been looking at. Well, you can rearrange this equation. For example, if we bring this term over to the other side, we're going to have gas minus liquid, chemical potential of the gas minus the chemical potential of the liquid. Since the gas is unaffected by the presence of a non-volatile solute, we can take that chemical, that difference in chemical potential to simply be the change in Gibbs energy associated with vaporization, and then we can rearrange the equation to solve for this, this term here. So we get natural log of the mole fraction of component A equals delta G of vaporization over RT. We recall that there's an enthalpy component to this and a entropy component to it. Um, what you can do then, I believe that the derivation follows from the um, uh, the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, which relates to how delta G changes with temperature. It's related to the change in enthalpy. So if you if you apply the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation to this to this equation, I won't take us through the details. You wind up with and make some assumptions along the way. You wind up with this um, uh, with these relationships here. This tells us that the boiling point of the solvent in solution is equal to the boiling point of the pure solvent plus a correction factor involving the molality of the solute. And then this is the boiling point elevation constant for the solvent. Okay, so Kb is a solvent property. It's expressed here in terms of the molar mass, gas constant, the pure liquids boiling point squared divided by the enthalpy of vaporization of the boiling point, and here's a conversion factor. Uh, and so this is always 
going to be a positive correction factor. Okay, so you can calculate the new boiling point if you know this Kb for the solvent and then you know the concentration of the solute. The magnitude of the temperature difference between the, solute, between the solution and the pure solvent is dependent upon just the concentration of solute. It doesn't depend upon the identity of the solute. And that's what makes it a colligative property. Uh, this diagram, I think it's just meant to illustrate the points I was making about the chemical potential equation here. So the chemical potential of the solvent in the gas phase is equal to the chemical potential of, the, um, of that component in the liquid phase. Here is the, a couple of Kb values for different substances. So for benzene, for phenol, for water, these are the Kb values. Uh, we're going to talk about the Kf values next. Uh, before we move on, I just want to point out that the Kf values are larger in magnitude than, than the Kb values, and that reflects the fact that the freezing point depression is a larger effect than the boiling point elevation, at least in terms of magnitude. Um, I guess here's just a, a few simple problems involving uh, boiling point elevation. I'll just sketch out what they've got. So. Uh, the boiling point constant for water for Kb is 0 0.51 Kelvin kilograms per mole. Calculate the boiling point elevation for a 0 0.1 molal solution. It's very easy. The boiling point of the solvent in solution is equal to the boiling point of the pure solvent plus the value of Kb times the molality that's given to us. Okay, so uh, the B here has a value of 0 0.1 moles per kilogram. So you just take, um, this would be for water to be 373 Kelvin. You just plug those numbers in. It's very easy. Okay, and then to do it for benzene is also is also easy. So I'll just leave that as an exercise for you uh, to try. Uh, this slide repeats the analysis for, um, for the freezing point depression. It's a little bit different and that's because in, in this diagram here uh, we're supposing that the solid has a higher density than the solution so the solid forms at the bottom of the solution so this wouldn't be water-based. Uh, in any case, so here is our, our solid forming. We've got our solution. The chemical potential of the solid solvent is equal to the chemical potential of the uh, solvent in solution when it's at equilibrium. And so the star here denotes that it's pure solid, and then the lack of the star here denotes that it's the solution. And so starting from there, then we use our relationship that we've talked about previously, the same one that we used in the boiling point elevation. If we rearrange it, that is if we move this term over here, we'll have solid minus liquid. The difference in chemical potential of the solid minus the liquid is equal to minus the Gibbs energy of fusion for that solvent. Okay, so that gives us this relationship. Note the minus sign that we have here, whereas before, when we were talking about vaporization, we had a plus sign. Rearranging this equation, using the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, making some approximations and, and, and redefinitions, you can derive this formula for the freezing point depression and this formula for the freezing point depression constant, which they look almost identical to the equations for the boiling point elevation, the only difference is this minus sign here. So in this case, the freezing point of the solvent in solution is the freezing point of the pure solvent minus this correction factor, where Kf depends only on the solvent properties over here, and Kb, or this B, sorry, is the uh, molality of component B. 
So again, it doesn't depend upon the identity of component B, it only depends upon its concentration. So it's a colligative property. Uh, you'll find that this, um, this problem is roughly identical to the one that I kind of skipped over. Uh, the only difference is that it's Tf equals Tf star minus Kf times B. It's that minus sign. Okay, so they give you the freezing point depression constant of water. Calculate the freezing point depression for a solute present at point one. So it's, I mean, the numbers, the only thing that's different is the minus sign and the number, right? Kf is not the same value as Kb. And so you solve this problem in the same way. Uh, notice that camphor has a very large, a large Kb, a Kf value. And so the freezing point depression, the magnitude of freezing point depression for, for camphor is going to be much larger than the than the magnitude of freezing point depression for, for water. So that does depend upon the, solv the solvent. Uh, and there's all sorts of other problems involving boiling point, um, boiling point and freezing point depression, most commonly freezing point depression. You know, if you prepare, um, if you prepare solutions with known molalities and measure the freezing point depression for all of the different solutions, you can use that to um, estimate the enthalpy of fusion for that um, for that particular substance. So you can use the colligative properties to de determine uh, enthalpies of fusion. In principle, you could do it for the for the uh, enthalpy of vaporization. However, the because the, the magnitude of the boiling point elevation is a lot smaller than it is than the freezing point depression, it's a bit it's a bit more difficult to measure, so I don't know that that's a very common experiment, but uh, we love doing these types of experiments in general chemistry and, and physical chemistry, uh, at least at the you know academic level for, for teaching purposes. Well, our last property here is um, involves osmosis. So osmosis involves the flow of a solvent into a solution via a semi-permeable membrane that, that gives rise to a pressure imbalance. I'll show you the figure first here. So in these two chambers, we've got, we've got pure solvent over here, and we've got um, pure solution, or we've got solution over here. And this is a semi-permeable membrane. And what I want to point out is that the, the you know, at equilibrium, when these two systems come to, and, and the semi-permeable membrane allows solvent to pass through freely, but not the solute. So, so solvent can go back and forth, but the solute can't escape through this membrane. So what I'll, what I'll point out is if you've got, let's say the two pressures were the same, so let's ignore this, this pi here for a moment. Uh, well, what would happen? So you've got, you've got your solvent here, uh, with its chemical potential, it's pure, your pure solvent, and then over here, in the absence of this extra pressure, you would have the chemical potential of the solvent in solution, which as we've been discussing, is lower than the chemical potential of the pure solvent. So the, the main rule in chemistry is that things go from high chemical potential to low chemical potential, and so if the solvent has a lower chemical potential than it does over here, it's going to go that way overall. And that's what happens. So as solvent comes in, that causes the, the, that causes the volume of the solution to increase. In order to prevent that from happening, you have to push down on the solution. That is, you have to force the volume back down you know, to keep the solvent from having a net transfer this direction. That extra pressure that you have to apply on the solution uh, is, is called the osmotic pressure. Here's another diagram illustrating the effect, uh, which this may be more familiar to you. You've got your solution inside this vessel right here. Here's the semi-permeable membrane. 
Here's your pure solvent. You've got atmospheric pressure pushing down on the solvent. Again, because there's a difference in concentration, the chemical potential of the solvent is higher than the chemical potential of the solvent in solution, and so the solvent starts to go into this uh, vessel. That causes the volume of the vessel to rise, and then the height of this column of liquid is proportional to the osmotic pressure. This is a hydrostatic pressure that's, that's pushing down on the solution. And so eventually, you know, the solvent's going to go into this vessel until the height of the, of the liquid column is high enough to equal the osmotic pressure, and then that's when equilibrium is reached between the two sides. So I basically explained um, all of that. So at equilibrium, once the once the, the solvent stops moving, okay, what you have is the difference in pressure between the, the pure solvent and the solution. But once equilibrium is reached, the chemical potential of the pure solvent will equal the chemical potential of the solvent in solution at that higher pressure. And then, you know, you can then express this in terms of the chemical potential of the pure solvent at that higher pressure plus this correction factor. So using this equation and um, some other mathematical tricks that I didn't want to show you, you can then derive the equation for this um, for this osmotic pressure where the osmotic pressure is expressed in terms of the molar concentration of the solute times RT. Uh, the molar concentration, so, so the magnitude of the osmotic pressure depends only upon the concentration of the solute. It doesn't depend upon the identity of the solute. So osmotic pressure is also uh, considered to be a colligative property. Uh, down below are just some, oh, I don't know, more interesting or more detailed uh, ways of thinking about the osmotic pressure. I do have a typo in this equation here. And then the notation switches, unfortunately. So here, this, this is the concentration of component B. Here we're changing the concentration, we're changing the components uh, label to J. So, so this is the concentration of that solute. Uh, there should be, it should be the concentration of J times RT and then this is the osmotic virial expansion, where you have one plus a virial coefficient times the concentration. Then there'd be a second virial concentration times the concentration squared, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, I've unfortunately I've left off the R times T, but the first virial term is just this result right here. So you can think of this one that you're probably familiar with. This is just the, the first term here in this osmotic virial expansion. Um, this is just truncating the osmotic virial expansion at the, um, at the first term. So this includes one correction beyond, uh, beyond um, I guess this is called the Vent, uh, Vent Hoff equation. And here I did get the RT back in. Uh, but this is another, uh, so this is just including only this term in the uh, virial expansion. So it goes one, one, one step beyond the Van Hoff equation. Uh, here's a graphic uh, demonstrating that uh, osmotic virial, um, or, or that, that illustrating this equation right here. Uh, if you plot the osmotic pressure of a solution divided by the concentration of the solution as a function of the concentration of solution at that first level of approximation, the slope of the line that you get is equal to the virial coefficient times r times t, and the intercept is equal to rt. You can see that in the equation here. This would be, if you plug in j equals zero, this would be, you would get rt. Um, and then uh, for, for this term here, and then the slope, like you, you should find that, that this quantity would be linear in the concentration, and then BRT is the slope. So what you can do, you can imagine 
getting some data points and fitting it to a line. So finding the numerical value of the intercept and the numerical value of the slope. And then you could take the ratio of the slope divided by the intercept and that would give you the, an estimate for the virial coefficient. The equation can be rewritten in terms of uh, a mass concentration. And so here it's the, same, it's the same equation, but just in a different concentration unit. And what you find in that case is that the intercept is equal to r times t divided by the molar mass. And so the idea here, if you don't know the molar mass of your substance, so you can't calculate the molarity, what you can do is you can use this mass concentration measure the osmotic pressure for different mass concentrations, find the intercept, and then the intercept is related to the molar mass. So you can use the osmotic pressure as a way of determining the molar mass of an unknown solute, uh, which is exactly what this um, problem is here. I won't, I won't go through it. Um, you, you basically need to, to take this data and plot it, you need to plot pi divided by the mass uh, concentration as a function of the mass concentration. So you would take, you would make a third row of numbers where you take this row divided by that row. That's going to form your y-axis. The concentration is going to form your x-axis. Then you're going to fit that data to a line and then find the intercept you set the intercept equal to RT over M and then solve for the molar mass. And so in this example, you're doing this for uh, a particular polymer uh, and you're trying to find its or estimate its molar mass. And so this would be something you could do. You could imagine using this technique, although I'm sure it's not the only technique you could use to estimate the molar mass of unknown synthetic polymers. How big is the molar mass of the polymer I made? or you could use it for proteins, biopolymers, things like that. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop this video right here, and we'll get back, uh, we'll get on to topic 5C in the next one.